Welcome to the second edition of the SEMA Dialogue Series. I'm David Williams. According to a recent SEMA report, if we carry on operating business as usual by 2030, it's estimated that we'll need the natural capital equivalent of two planets to sustain ourselves. To look at the impact that business has on nature and some of the methodologies that business can use to account for nature, I have a panel of uh, expert guests. In studio in Johannesburg, we have Peter Lukey, who is Chief Policy Advisor for the Strategic Environmental Intelligence and Environmental Advisory Services Unit for the Department of Environmental Affairs in South Africa. Francois Bailefeld, who's Senior Specialist uh, for Business Analytics at Enterprise Performance Management at SAP Africa. And then joining us from London is uh, Sandra Rapaccioli, who is Head of Sustainability Research and Policy at SEMA. And in Lagos, uh, Kago Ariz Nwoke, who is Finance and Planning Manager for Shell Nigeria Gas. Welcome to all of you. Some very long titles there. Sandra, looking at the report that you've put out, uh, you've got uh, natural capital as a term. Maybe that's what's required to get the attention of business. What is your report telling us about the issue of natural capital? Well, it might help if I start with the definition of natural capital so that we all are on the same page with that. Natural capital is essentially the world's stock of natural assets. So it includes elements that provide value to people, such as forests, rivers, as well as uh, services, such as pollination services or carbon storage services. And the issue is that natural capital is being depleted at an alarming rate, which is causing big problems to businesses and societies. But unfortunately, natural capital still remains an elephant in the boardroom. It's largely ignored in corporate accounts, uh, decision making and business models. And investors don't really pay much attention to it either. Um, they continue to focus on short term financials and that situation has to change. Well, thanks, uh, Sandra. I'm going to bring our guests in Johannesburg into the, in the studio here. Peter, uh, looking at uh, the elephant in the room, that's a phrase that's come up, and I think that's the kind of phrase that gets the attention. Why is it an elephant in the room when it seems so obvious to we've got to look after the re natural resources of the planet? Well, it's nice that it's an elephant in the room and not something else mm. <coughs> from, a from a biodiversity point of view. The reality, of course, is that this is true. Um, it, the whole concept of natural capital was what was brought forward in, in uh, Agenda 21 um, 20 years ago now around sustainable development and it's seen as one of the most important aspects, one of the three pillars of sustainable development. And Sandra, of course, is perfectly correct, is that it's one area that is ignored completely. And to a large extent, I mean, I think the discussion around uh, natural capital has really been from the biologists and the, and the environmentalists. And they have not, I don't believe they've been really speaking the correct language. Mm. And it's, I think this particular report is important because it starts speaking the language. And to be honest, one of the things that we really are struggling with is even the definition of natural capital. And then going on to the whole sort of situation is how do you account for natural capital? Mm. And that's not the purvey of, of uh, biologists and, and ecologists. Mm. That is the, the area of accountants. And so it's really, really important that this discussion starts involving accountants because it really is the, at the basis of business. Mm. I'm going to come back to you to ask, uh, you're an advisor to the government in South Africa, how well South Africa is doing in this area. But let's bring in uh, Francois Bailefeld. Francois, you're at SAP Africa. Uh, so from your perspective, uh, Africa, presumably you're looking at the continent rather than just South Africa. Yes. How are we doing in Africa? Well, I think uh, from an SAP perspective is um, we've got already customers in Africa that's already applying some of the natural capital uh, methodology, if you can call it like that, uh, into our solutions, uh, specifically focusing on Ghana at the moment. Uh, but yes, also from a global perspective, we've got uh, customers that's using our sustainability management solutions um, and applying like our GRI group reporting initiative and also focusing on integrated reporting. Mm -hmm. I think also another uh, aspect which is also important from natural capital is the risk that's associated with natural capital. Uh, and once again, in that area, we've uh, got solutions in place called uh, group risk and compliance, which obviously focusing on it. But I think also important thing just to talk further on uh, na natural capital is actually how do you actually measure this mm. uh, from that perspective and I think let's come back to measurement in a moment and uh, with Peter with the South African angle but I'd like to bring in Kago before we go any further just to get everyone into the discussion uh, in Nigeria you work for Shell Nigeria gas uh, Kago obviously this is something I mean by definition if you're in the resources sector you have a finite resource 
Uh, gas is certainly not renewable, natural gas. So uh, where does this fit into your company's uh, approach? So basically at the moment, even as a, sh a shell globally, we, we look at uh, natural capital in our decisions. Basically we have sustainability factors in, in, in our decisions, even if it's our, our short-term performance decisions. So most of the time we consider this. And I know that uh, as a company in Shell, we have a, a social responsibility to make sure that we consider some of these factors because it's something that will really bite any company that doesn't embrace it in the long run. I want to come back to you to ask how Shell incorporates it into their decision making so that it gets the attention of employees. But coming back to you, Sandra, in London, tell me a bit more about this report. And uh, it seems clear that you have to get the attention of people. What about this report is going to get the attention? Yeah, I mean, w what we wanted to, to show was that um, natural resources are being depleted at an unsustainable rate. We are already using 50% more natural resources than the Earth can replenish. And as you mentioned in your introduction, if we carry on business as usual, by 2030, we'll need the equivalent of two planets worth of natural resources. So that situation is unsustainable and businesses and we believe accountants have got a really important role to play um, they need to start understanding their relationship with nature much much better so both their dependencies on critical natural resources to help them do business as well as their impacts on nature and in the report we, we also look at what the key role is for the finance person, how they can help navigate their organisations through natural capital depletion. Just to stay with you Sandra for a moment, uh, in your experience from a SEMA perspective as well because you represent this kind of accountant, the management accountants who are really looking forward rather than backwards at what the company's already done, what, what is your experience on how to get their attention and once you've got it to get them in going in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's almost five key steps um, when it comes to engaging businesses in natural capital accounting and opportunities um, that the finance person should be involved in. The first step is to raise a natural capital depletion at a strategic issue, so that's at board level, and that's the role of the CFO to bring it to the board and then make the business case for it. You know, why should we start accounting for natural capital and considering that in our decision making? And the business case will include things like forecasting and modelled scenarios, which is exactly the remit of the management accountant. Then once the, the, the case has been made at the board level, the second step is to measure and value a company's natural capital impacts and dependencies. The accountant can help help that. Um, help that process. The third step then is to ensure that you use that information in decision making because information is just data. You need to use those insights in decision making whether it's strategic planning, um, making sure that you know your plans for the next five, ten years have got the fundamental natural resources to support the delivery of those plans. It can be used in investment appraisal decisions. Many many decisions um, should be informed by natural capital information. Then the fourth step is to engage in the debate. So there's a lot going on at the moment in terms of natural capital accounting, both on the government side and corporate side. There are standards that are being developed. So it's really important, particularly for CFOs, to get involved in the debate and to influence the development of, of certain standards and metrics. And finally, um, number five is make sure you have the right skills in the organisation for natural capital accounting. So CFOs should look at the skills in their finance team. Um, do you have the right people with the right skills to help embed this information into decision making and reporting? And, and also, this needs a transdisciplinary approach. It's not going to be one profession that solves a problem. The finance people may need to speak to biologists, to engineers, to meteorologists when they're doing their, their forecasting and their modelled scenarios. So, you know, get, get the right skills in the organisation, but also bring in other expertise from um, external partners. 
Well, Sandra, that's a great summary of the issues, and I think we're going to return to each of them. But let's come back to Peter, and I asked how South Africa was doing in particular. You're an advisor to the government. Uh, go this government, all governments, have a lot on their plates. Our government in particular is making up for a lot of things from the past, as well as trying to deal with the present and the future. Yep. So how's our emphasis been in this area? Well, to be honest, not bad. Um, in terms of uh, where we're going as, as government, first of all, our national development plan specifically mentions natural capital and specifically mentions the problem that we're actually using it up faster than we're actually replenishing it. Yeah. And so the National Development Plan acknowledges the problem and then hopefully um, is, is provides a plan on, on, on certainly starting to look at them. Are we better at other than other countries at not using up our natural capital no, too terrible. quickly? No, we're, we're, no, we're terrible. No, we're hopeless. We're hopeless. And we always surprise. Whenever we do a State of the Environment report or a, a Strategic Environmental Outlook, and we see that the quality of our rivers are going down and the, and the quality of our waters are going down and, and our grasslands are disappearing and what have you. We always throw our hands up in shock. But I mean, this is just an obvious calculation. I mean, if you keep on taking without giving back, of course, it's going to be depleted. And so we shouldn't be shocked. Uh, so we have to start looking at mechanisms of how we can give it back. And giving it back is not just around biodiversity and the natural areas. I mean, it's basically around this natural capital, yeah. what we're calling ecological infrastructure, the stuff that by provides us with basic um, life-giving and life-enhancing goods and services. Yeah. And with climate change, this becomes even more important is because uh, building up that ecological infrastructure is the easiest way of actually building resilience to change. Yeah. And so the time is absolutely right now that we start looking at giving something back. Yeah. And uh, at, at the moment, I mean, South Africa, looking at the whole offsetting approach, for example, um, is, is very, very progressive in our thinking. Offsetting, that's like uh, the carbon exchange type. Absolutely, uh, but it goes way beyond carbon. I mean, there's, there's real double whammies, for example. You can have a sort of situation where you're doing carbon offsetting in um, succulent karoo, for example, by restoring succulent karoo, having huge biodiversity impacts and also restoring the productivity of the land. Mm. So you get these three uh, benefits from an investment in ecological infrastructure. Mm. I want to come back to you on, you mentioned the crew on fracking and uh, what that could or couldn't do and where that fits into natural capital. But Kerat, you wanted to talk about measurement and I think Sandra has established very clearly, you've got to get the attention, Francois, sorry, not Kerat, Francois. Uh, Sandra has established uh, very yeah. clearly that you need to get the uh, attention of the accountants yeah. because then you can measure things. So yeah. tell me about measurement. Yeah, I think the big thing that... Uh, we are facing, you know, like, like accountants, is the massive amounts of data. Uh, you know, big data is becoming a huge discussion. And actually, obviously, how do we manage this? Because if you think about natural capital, this is just another element of big data we bring into the boardroom. Um, and from an SAP perspective, obviously, we've got solutions in place to assist to, uh, to bring and harness and bring that big data into play and Can integrate. Mean, what do you mean by big data? Okay, big data is basically massive amounts of data stored in different places and it could be in spreadsheets, it could be in systems, um, and et cetera, and obviously in different, different environments, and obviously bringing that all into play. Uh, if you talk about natural capital, we don't actually have, obviously, uh, and I'm not talking from SAP, I'm just saying from an accounting point mm. of view, we, uh, there is no really systems in place to, to track that. Um, and I think, you know, obviously, as we're saying with uh, SAP, we want to bring to the uh, plate is basically to say we've got solutions in place, bring that big data into play and then visualize it through CFO dashboards yeah. uh, to bring it into the boardroom um, and obviously then to start looking at it from a measurement perspective to say, okay, we've got targets in place, what is our actual, obviously where, where are we uh, uh, measured you know, in terms of our peers, where, where are we actually doing? And I think that's also another thing, how do we actually measure it in terms of other countries, how are we actually doing in South Africa compared to other countries. And um, as we've mentioned, you know, it's terrible. Mm. Kago, I just want to bring you in there quickly just to talk about uh, how Shell integrates this process, this attitude into its decision making. I mean, I know mining companies sometimes say, uh, we start every board meeting with a safety report because that's top of mind for us. How do you make sure that the business thinks natural capital in its processes and everyday systems? In Shell, we actually have the sustainability report and that report actually is published globally. It shows clearly Shell's impact on the environment, the impact of our operations on the environment. And clearly, we have to consider that. So we usually, before making any decision, we look at the health implication, the safety, the security, and most importantly, the environmental impact of that decision. 
And then in taking the solution, we look at the solution that has the minimal impact to the environment. Really, because we don't really want to have um, um, issues with our supply chain. We, we know there are reputational damages that could cause that. So it's really something we take seriously. And with the sustainability reports, it's made visible to the whole world the impact of our operations. It's also benchmarked against the global statistics. And uh, we aim actually to really improve that space. Sandra in London, I know you have to leave us uh, now because of time constraints, but I'd like a fi final word from you from your report. Who's doing well, maybe in countries, maybe in companies? Who's setting the example in this field? There are some really excellent examples of best practice. Puma, for example, was uh, the first organization in the world to provide produce an environmental profit and loss account. So what that means is that they put a monetary value on their negative impacts on the environment and society. And then they've used that information to identify what the hotspots are in their value chain in terms of impacts. And that's where they're focusing their, their resources and trying to kind of minimize those impacts. Coca-Cola as well, that's an interesting example. Water scarcity obviously has a very material risk on their business. So water stewardship is extremely important to Coca-Cola and they're working with a, a lot of local community projects to try and put back as much water as they use. So to try and have a zero water impact. Um, and another one that, that I think is fascinating is Dow Chemical. They've been looking at the true value of nature in their organisation and how they can work better with nature. So they were due to upgrade one of their water treatment facilities in Texas. Um, to upgrade it would have cost them $40 million. And they decided to see whether there was a natural solution that could basically do the same job. So they constructed a wetland to filter wastewater. That cost them 1.5 million and was fully operational within 18 months. So it, it, it just shows how understanding your relationship with nature and the true value from natural assets can really bring benefits to business, both in terms of risk management and quite big cost efficiencies as well. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks for joining us. That's uh, Sandra Rapacciolo, who is the Head of Sustainability Research and Policy at SEMA. She has to leave our discussion now, and we're taking the opportunity to go to a quick uh, break. More on the relationship between business and natural capital when we return. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're talking natural capital on this edition of the SEMA Dialogue Series and uh, still in the studio with me I have Peter Lukey from South Africa's Department of Environmental Affairs, Francois Bailefeld from uh, SAP Africa and joining us from Lagos, uh, Kega Ariza Nwaki who is from Shell Nigeria Gas. Well and before we carry on with the discussion let's have a quick look at uh, this insert on the relationship between business and natural capital. Toyota has been in South Africa for over 50 years. We caught up with Mary Willemse to find out more about Toyota South Africa's views on sustainability. Toyota SA defines sustainability as its ability to manage a combination of environmental, social and economic elements and optimise their impact on key stakeholders. In South Africa specifically, we have been in this country for 50 years in operation. We have been the market leader for 34 consecutive years, currently in our 35th year. The Toyota story in South Africa started in 1961 when Dr. Albert Bessels, our founder, imported 10 Toyota pickups. Um, since then, the company has grown into the market leader, as I said. And furthermore, in Africa, we have quite a strong footprint. We have the rights to sell and manufacture in Sub-Saharan Africa. That includes Botswana, Namibia, Swaziland, Lesotho, and of course, South Africa. And then we export to 45 uh, countries in Africa from our plant in Prospectin. The core countries include Nigeria, Algeria, Angola, Zambia and Kenya. We're not a JSP listed company, so it's not a legal requirement for us to do a sustainability report, but because we believe that transparent management and good corporate governance is core of what we do, it's part of our global vision, we are a good corporate citizen, we feel that it's very important for us to 
document our sustainability and details in a, in a formal report which takes an annual format. We do one every year and we're very proud of the stories that we tell in that. We have some really nice success stories that we tell about how all the different stakeholders get involved towards a common goal of sustainable mobility. The objective of Toyota South Africa's sustainability report is to convey their efforts to realise harmony with people, societies and the global environment as well as ensure a sustainable society through manufacturing. So basically we look at addressing all the key stakeholders. So from a customer perspective, we obviously, um, from a sustainability perspective, make sure that we have sustainable, good customer relationship figures and customer satisfaction index. We have specific plans and actions in place to make sure that those levels don't drop and continue to rise. Um, at core of that, and, and at everything we do, is, is the quest for quality, durability and reliability um, in everything we do. From a dealer perspective, which is of course another important stakeholder, we have specific eco-standards that the dealer has to meet. Also from a supplier level, we will not do business with a company that's not at a minimum ISO 14001 accredited. So those things are very important to Toyota from a sustainability perspective. And I think it should be important for corporate South Africa to ensure that they do business in a sustainable way um, to ensure future growth. From our perspective, it, it really is important to ensure a sustainable future, not only for this country, but for business in Africa and export business specifically. It's very important to ensure that we have the correct figures and the right attitude towards sustainable growth to ensure a future. Peter, I want to come back, and I don't know how much you can say about this, but it seems an obvious question to ask. So if you're a management accountant and you're looking at a project that your company is doing, uh, the Karoo, the possibility of uh, fracking, natural gas, shale gas, etc. How would you think about this differently compared to the way people have done it in the past? Well, if we thought about it differently, perhaps we wouldn't have had climate change. Um, you know, <laughs> that's being glib, of course. The reality, of course, I mean, with, when you're looking at non-renewable resources, the accounting becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and with fossil fuels, e equally so. Um, so just from a business model, uh, extracting fossil fuels to a point of view is, is, is an interesting dif uh, and is quite a difficult business model from an accounting perspective. Mm. If, for instance, the use of those fuels are also leading to the destruction of the planet, and made, you know, then it becomes a very, very difficult accounting uh, equation. Mm. And Shell um, has, I think, quite a challenge ahead of them, as do all the fossil fuel companies. Mm. Yeah, let's go to Kago on that, seeing that she works for Shell by a coincidence. You, you know this, the story of Alcaru and of course Louisiana in the US, the shale gas opportunity. Uh, it's very difficult for a company whose business is extracting gas and oil to slow down, isn't it, if the demand is there? So do you say, well, there's demand, we have to meet it? We don't just say the demand, we have to meet it, but we have to look at alternatives. So what are the alternatives out there for us to be able to meet this demand with minimal impact to the environment? Those are things that need to be considered in trying to look for the optimal solution. So yes, there's a demand, but then there are more sustainable ways of meeting those demands. What's the impact on water? What's the impact on the environment? What's the impact in the ground? And how, how, how does it um, tell in the long term? Because really, we're, we're aiming or we are really a sustainable company and we intend to stay beyond the 21st century. And these are things we need to consider now in trying to run our business before we close down. And that's not the intent. I suppose it also depends, uh, Francois, on what kind of company you see yourself as. I mean, the famous story of Kodak, they thought they were in film. They weren't. They were in images of people. They needed to change their technology to carry on in that business. Mm. Shell, I think all the big companies, they're energy companies now as opposed to oil or gas companies. In Africa, there must be a temptation with high growth, and we've seen it in South Africa as well. Eskom, coal-fired power stations. The mm. alternative, sun, wind, nuclear. Yeah. But meanwhile, we've got no alternative, so we just have to burn coal, and mm. it's cheaper. Mm. So that argument seems to win every time. In Africa, the temptation must be, look, we'll worry about the environment later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you're correct what you're saying. I think um, what we've also seen you know, from, uh, from, from our point of view is that um, I think there's not enough done as yet. You know, there's obviously a lot of, um, uh, you know, people that's looking at, 
at SAP to say come up with solutions to obviously help us, you know, to to measure the the, the impact of the environment. Um, I can definitely say north from South Africa, we're definitely getting much more involved with. Uh, with Give people. me an example of uh, where you've got involved and and you've made a difference. Yeah, I think obviously in, in Ghana, you know, it's a typical example. Um, we, we basically uh, looked at a reconciliation solution between um, energy companies and the government, uh, where they basically would say, okay, what is the inputs and what is the outputs, and actually doing a reconciliation process to understand what is going to be the risk uh, on, on the environment. So, um, but that is like a, a solution whereby we facilitate it with them constantly, obviously to make sure, you know, obviously they, they're doing it rightly and properly, and we want to ensure, you know, that obviously that continues. Um, I also think, you know, if we just go beyond Africa as well, uh, as I mentioned, we're very, very much involved with uh, in integrated reporting, and sustainability is obviously one of those uh, parts to the integrated report. Mm. Uh, so we've got a lot of um, SAP customers as part of that global pilot program for integrated reporting, and obviously we constantly assist them as well. And SAP is also part of that pilot program. Mm. Okay. I think, David, yeah. if I may, um, <coughs> you know, in terms of this discourse, this whole aspect of actually starting to value mm. natural capital. You know, sticking to the energy theme, for example, and you mm. said, for instance, we have coal and, and these sort of things. The reality is that South Africa is only second to Chile in terms of our solar resources. We have the second highest solar resource in the world. That's where our real wealth lies, but we're not measuring that wealth. We're not valuing that wealth. In actual fact, what we're doing is we're measuring what we've measured for the last 20, 40, 50, 60, 100 years. Mm. And that's what we're basing our value on. The reality is that in terms of our solar resource, even if we have 200 years of coal, that the, the, the actual energy caught up in that coal is equal to 5% of what we get on a daily basis from the sun. Mm -hmm. So in terms of looking at new, and this is, this is what this is calling for. It's calling for a complete change in thinking and a change in thinking around business. Where does the business potential really lie? And in terms of the wealth of nations, South Africa's wealth lies in its sunlight. Mm. And so therefore, in terms of our businesses that really should be developing, rather than talking about a whole bunch of other businesses in, in areas that we're not quite sure about what the resource looks like, we should be looking at the areas where we know, where we have this huge wealth and mm. start exploiting and, and, and that wealth as much as we can. Okay. And this kind of dialogue around natural capital starts giving a financial value to this, and it starts putting this, this, this question into the boardrooms. So d isn't the game changer then that once you value uh, what solar power can do for you, as an example, yeah. the rest of Africa, many countries must also have a lot of sun. Mm. It's interesting that we, the second, South Africa is the second biggest sun receiver uh, after Chile. Um, so if you've got all these uh, ideas and projects, solar and so on, but it's too expensive. However, if you value what it can do for you, it stops looking expensive. Isn't that where you come in, is to show how you can value the future potential of something? No, no, absolutely, yeah. So um, once again, we want to come back to our solution where we, from a strategic, strategic point of view, um, we can obviously put a solution together to, to look at that value of uh, natural capital. But, you know, as Peter mentioned, you know, it's, you know I, I'm just always thought about, you know, how to value like aspect like coal. Obviously, we're burning coal and obviously, you know, it's going into the air. Uh, but I could just mention her from a, from a, from a uh, ESCOM, they're doing a lot of work um, in terms of integrated reporting. Mm. So, um, I mean, if you look at their report and what they're bringing about, they're already exposing it out there and saying, obviously, they're doing something about this. But that's so reporting. Are yeah. they doing anything about solar energy, well, as an example? Yeah, I'm not an expert. Yeah, uh, but I don't think yeah. they are. I think yeah. they're battling just to keep the coal-fired stations going. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me go to Kago in, in Nigeria. Do you see yourself, obviously Shell is an energy company, do you see yourself getting into things like solar energy and wind power? Uh, yes, I think uh, those are some of the options that we're considering and uh, we're still exploring those areas. And have you put a value on them? And I mean, I'm just trying to find out to what extent companies are doing what uh, Peter has been talking about, mm. trying to put a value on it to say this is the next big thing and we've actually got to get it into our accounting systems. Are you doing that yet? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think uh, basically those are things that we, we, we're looking at doing sometime soon. Okay. Because already we have the sustainability reporting, which is like a full report that shows the whole impact of our operations. But on the accounting bit and the reporting bit, um, it's not a separate report at the moment because these are factored in into all our 
decisions and uh, maybe it's not that um, visible like uh, Sandra spoke about, but I'm sure it's work in progress. Peter, I want to come back to where you said we're terrible. Uh, we, we're quite advanced in thinking about things, but we're terrible at doing it. Mm -hmm. At what point, I mean, you talked about integrated reporting. Sustainability type reporting has been around for some time. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at SA Breweries for a time, and uh, they aimed at being water neutral, so that they, whatever water they use, they somehow put back into the system. Great. And uh, Coke was mentioned earlier by, by Sandra. But, you know, policy and reality. So how close are we to not being terrible, and what do we have to do to not be terrible? Well, I think, first of all, one of the things that we're doing is at the moment as a department and with our partners in water affairs and with agriculture and so on and so forth, is developing a strategic infrastructure program on ecological infrastructure, looking purely at ecological infrastructure and water security. And how, for instance, our investment in wetlands and what we call our water factories. And, uh, you may not know this, but for instance, 50% of our water runoff comes from only 8% of our land. And, and none of that is protected. So that's, and we're a water poor country, and you'd expect that that's exactly what should happen. So we're starting to start thinking about this, this uh, investment in ecological infrastructure. And through that process, uh, allowing a vehicle for companies as well to start doing the same, to start offsetting their impacts and building up this resilience. And I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, in terms of the kind of impact of this. I mean, this is not just a trivial situation of a, a small company doing something, what have you. I mean, entire city states do this. I mean, the, the city of New York, for example, doesn't filter its water because of ecological infrastructure and its natural capital. Mm. It had the decision of, for instance, either building a very, very expensive $3 billion uh, filtration plant mm. or looking after its natural systems. And so what it did was declare the Catskills a natural park. And that provides clean, fresh water to a city the size of New York mm basically for free. And that's the kind of sort of situation, is that the more we destroy our natural capital, it has to be, it's those goods and services are irreplaceable. Mm. So we have to basically bring them back by building infrastructure. And as you know, South Africa is not so great in terms of our maintaining infrastructure. We're great at building, mm. but afterwards maintaining and what have you, we're not so hot at. This is free maintenance. Mm. And so that thinking is, has to come in. And I think um, there is a, a strong drive within government at the moment to start say, looking at this holistically. And the nice thing is the National Development Plan does that. It's, it sets the target of this thing of we have to have a set of natural resource indicators, which is the accounting, the measurement. The measurement is the stuff that starts giving us an indication. Again, it comes back to measurement to get the attention of everyone. And uh, the trouble with the National Development Plan, it's very big and there's lots of things in it and each champion of each of those things thinks it's a priority. Yeah, I think uh, it just comes back yeah, to this National Development uh, Plan. I think, first of all, you have to have a framework as Peter mentioned, you have to have a framework in place. Once you have that framework, that will then spill into to a, some measurement framework uh, or key performance indicator framework. Uh, and I think they're already obviously doing some work in that regard. Now, this comes back to the big data discussion. Mm. So obviously we've got departments all over the country, okay, and we have to collect that data and integrate that data and obviously report on that data. Um, so it is doable. It, it, can, be, it can be measured. And the risk associated with those KPIs, especially related to natural capital, can be associated with that KPI as well. And so you can actually bring the risk in. And I think the big thing is we want to make this visible, not just from a CFO perspective, but also in a boardroom, uh, in a government perspective. We want to make this uh, data visible to them to start taking action uh, and obviously bring that back. Um, I think also just, I just want to put, put another slant on this is that uh, it's not just stopping with the monitoring and the measuring of the KPI, okay? We actually want to take it a step further. We want to start looking at predictive uh, analytics. Mm. What I mean by that is we want to take these measures and obviously want to see what is the impact going to be that over time and put uh, preventative measures in place mm. and try and uh, let chaos not happen, you know? And I think that's we want to have an early warning, early alert system. It uh, all sounds like no-brainer to me, but that doesn't mean boardrooms will pay attention. Boards don't <coughs> always have brains in them, so uh, it's an issue. Mm. Let's uh, go to the audience now, and uh, I suspect they've got a couple of comments or questions uh, from our little audience that we have here uh, at our panel discussion. Can I see if anyone would like to ask a question? Yes, you could just identify yourself, sir, and uh, your comment or question. <coughs> yeah, my name is Harold. I'm a SEMA... Alliance member. Uh, the question, and it, it sort of comes from a comment firstly <clears throat> that Sandra made with regards to uh, Puma 
and the fact that they, in terms of their, their environmental assessment, they are working with a profit and loss account. And, and one of the discussions that was happening over the break has just to do with the fact that the f for, for there to be proper movement, uh, in my view, with regards to, to this important um, topic, is there needs to be a sense of accountability. Now, the way accountants think, or the way we've been taught to think, is if, 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 if something is to be taken care of in an enterprise perspective, it needs to be considered as an asset. And if it's an asset that's in the balance sheet of an entity, that asset needs to be controlled. Now, a lot of the natural capital is not controlled. And, and that's why it would be interesting for me to get a sense of what Puma is doing with regards to their balance sheet, because uh, I would suspect that they are utilizing natural resources that they really don't have full control of. And I think that's where uh, the governments uh, come in uh, with regards to, to that, because generally, with a lot of the natural capital, it's owned to a large extent by the governments. And so they have a prime position of creating that accountability and, and awareness so that they can then, in a way, encourage the boardrooms to start reacting. Mm. So, so it's easy for us as accountants to say, okay, this is how we can measure, this is how we can gather the data, this is, this is the impact it has to the environment. Mm. But if, if uh, the, the boardroom management are looking at the, the, the bottom line and they're saying, okay, yes, it, it, it definitely has an impact, but we're not gonna feel the impact now. However, what we are doing is benefiting our bottom line now. Mm. Uh, it becomes a more, more difficult. Yeah, I think one of the problems in mining companies, resource companies generally, is that the managers today uh, are not going to live with the consequences of their decisions. So they want to be rewarded now. The investors want to be rewarded now. I want to go to, to Kago on this. Uh, the Nigerian government and your dealings with them, uh, do, do you get a sense that they are sensitive to these issues and that they are going to be proactive about uh, natural resources in Nigeria? Um, at the moment, I think it's something um, the DPR, which is the, the department in charge of those natural resources, they, they, they consider that in granting licenses. So uh, I know that there is some kind of um, consideration given to natural resources depletion as they issue licenses. But whether it is so detailed and probably how, whether it's, it leads to rejections of licenses or some kind of rejections, I'm not uh, privy to that information. Okay. Governments taking the lead on this because uh, as the, the point Well, Harold is, is, is spot on. I mean, there's, this is really um, the world inc. It's not, it's not one sector dealing mm. with this sort of situation. Mm. And in terms of the, the triple bottom line of sustainability, it involves the whole sort of situation because the same argu can, argument can be made about, for instance, social capital mm. and, your, and business impact on social capital mm. is that businesses do not control society. Mm. And it's the same kind of accounting as is required. And, and so there is a requirement of a real partnership between government, mm. civil society and business and industry. And that's why the skills are required. And, and that the accounting skills here are just, I think, are desperately short in terms of thinking around this. And that's where this real partnership should start, is the measurement and then that accounting mm, yeah. idea. Francois, what's your sense of the skills? As Sandra said, one of the issues, the five key areas that she raised mm. was you've got to develop the skills for natural capital accounting. And when mm. you talk about natural capital accounting, it sounds like a field of study. It sounds yes. like a legitimate area. It sounds like you do a course in it. Uh, it sounds like the skills should be developed. Where are we with the skills? Yeah, I think, look, there's a lot of reports out. There's a lot of information about natural capital. Um, I think there's a lot of awareness. Uh, but to talk about uh, natural capital accounting, I think, yes, we've still got a lot of work to do in that area. Uh, we've got normal profit and loss statements. We speak about GDP. Uh, so everything is very much financially orientated. Uh, and I was just thinking, you know, maybe we should start looking at natural capital mm. uh, domestic product as yep. an example. I'm just using that as, a, a, as an example yep. and actually see actually how do we measure that uh, and try and put a value if we can, try and put a value. But there's still a lot of work to be done. I think we've got the systems in place. Mm. Uh, it's just putting the intellect into play.
Yeah. All right. Well, if I may, on, on yeah. this, I mean, I think it's an important point because, <coughs> first of all, Sandra gave a definition of, of natural capital, and that was one definition. There are hundreds, unfortunately. There's no accepted definition of natural capital, and there certainly is no accepted system of measurement. Uh, the United Nations University uh, have developed a thing called the Integrated Wealth Index, which looks at um, built capital, human capital, and natural capital. And so they're making a real attempt to start measuring this stuff. And they published a report, which I'm afraid South Africa did really to, really to be poor on. Uh, in fact, we did exceptionally poorly on. But for the first time, we're actually starting to measure the stuff in a comparable way. Yeah. And so you get organizations like United Nations as well, who are working in as well. And I can see that they were quoted in, the, in, in this report as well. So it looks as if there is a groundswell of um, academic and uh, thought around this as well. But it really, as I said, once again, it, it kind of is in the domain of economists and biologists. Mm. And it needs to start going towards accountants and to start getting Keeps the numbers coming back right. to that. I mean, and, that and, that's, and that's really what it boils down yeah. to, I think. Well, and my impression is that SEMA is doing its best to uh, stimulate this, yeah. this trend. Another question or comment from the audience was over there. Yes, sir. Just uh, two quick questions. My name is Niku Kamfer. Um, and I think they, they interlink. Um, the one is just to ask, uh, do you think the, the increase in, in, or the rapid increase in population, South Africa globally, um, contributes to the quick depletion of natural capital, number one? And number two, do you think the implementation of all these reports um, will actually help to sustain natural capital or only delay the inevitable of total depletion. Thank you. Mm. Who wants to take I'd that? I'd love to take that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First of all, the population element is, is that it's not, that's a very much a reductionist view. It's not poor people that are causing the reductions. It's the rich people that are using the resources. So if, for instance, you're looking at, at, at uh, population reductions, it really is the sector of society you should be reducing who's causing the damage if you take it as a reductionist view. The reality, once again, is that, I mean, the planet's carrying capacity in terms of human numbers. We're starting to slow down, and, and eventually we'll slow down hugely when we start running out of resources, unfortunately. But using population as basically the reductionist a a aspect is, is not the way, it's not the answer. Of course, in population pressure, as development pressure, is, is, is as strong. So I'd be wary of going away, going to those sort of situations and start measuring what the impacts of the society are. And the reality is that in terms of sustainability, there are three elements. The, the, the first one is, is around technology, is looking at new sustainable technologies. The second one is behavior change. It's about production and consumption. It's, as I said, it's not the poor people that are causing the damage. It's the rich people that are causing the damage. They're consuming. You know. And then the third thing is starting to give back, which is this whole aspect of, uh, of offsetting and, and, and basically giving back to the na nature. Mm. So I think, I mean, that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's an important element, I think, in terms of the way you're doing it. And I've forgotten the second part because yes, I was so I excited about the first too. part. You <laughs> must ask two questions because we, you know, we can only do one thing at a time. What was, this, what was the second question again? Now the second question, it was just around the, the really putting all the resources and time into the implementation of these reporting. Will it work? Yes. 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 Well, do you want to t pick up that one, Francois? Yeah, I think uh, talking from an SAP perspective again, yes, we've got uh, solutions in place. I think, as you said, there's a lot of manual reporting you know, happening at the moment. Uh, but we've got solutions in place to obviously help you uh, automating those, those reports. But I think what, uh, just to come back to your question as well, we want to create awareness. I think that's important. People are consuming these natural resources. Mm. And how do we create that awareness? Yes, we can report on it, but we can also report it through a dashboard. So it doesn't get stuck on a CFO level, but as I've mentioned, you know, go through to the government sector and obviously link up with the National Development Program uh, to link that back to, to government. But I think also from a governmental perspective is they need to push it to corporates as well. Mm. I mean, obviously there could be a target, you know, a, a national target, but there can also be a target set for, for corporates. And obviously corporates have to adhere to that target. So um, yes, I think it's not just about awareness, but also then taking that uh, a step further. Just okay. want to bring in Kaga there, possibly the mm. last contribution from her in Lagos. Uh, the long term, I mean, it's been tempting for companies for many years not to think long term because they can't imagine that the resources will run out. Companies like Shell, I would imagine, have long term projections and they have to think about when the gas or the oil is actually going to run out. How much of the thinking in your company is uh, looking at compensating for that down the line? Uh, before we venture into any projects, 
even at the exploration phase, we already think through the life cycle of the project. So we think about the exploration, the development, up to the end when we abandon. So it's a whole value chain that makes sure that whatever impact we, we create to the environment in this whole process is being considered till the long term, which is at how many years in the future when we're going to abandon. So the life cycle of the whole project considers that, and uh, that aids our decision making. Okay, I want to ask for a kind of a summary. I mean, this is not an issue one can sum up. Uh, one has to just stop the discussion. But another point I'd like to raise is the difference between renewable resources and non-renewable resources. So there's a certain amount of coal in the world. Mm. When it's gone, it's gone. But water is renewable. Uh, it can be looked after. Paper, trees are renewable. I always get irritated when they say at the bottom of the piece of paper, please save a tree and don't print out this email. Mm, yeah. They can grow more trees. So I don't go with that. So how do you think differently about renewable and non-renewable. No, it's an important one, and I think th this measurement is an, is an important element of it. And if I can pick up on the last part of that, qu the second question as well, is that it's not the case of measuring and reporting. It's what you measure and what you report. Yeah. It's not the amount of activities you're doing, or the amount of money that you're doing, or the amount of plans that you put mm -hmm. in place, but it's the actual measurement of the outcome of those activities, whether that outcome is improving things. And that's where we are not very good at. We're mm -hmm. great at measuring how much exactly. stuff we're doing. But I mean, in a way, in a way of answering mm -hmm. that question, there's certain things that are going to run out. Absolutely. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, I don't think a lot of people appreciate that South Africa is running out of gold. It will run out of platinum, coal, iron ore. It's just that it's not going to happen yet, so mm. we can't imagine it, uh, Francois. Yeah, um, no, you 100%. I think talking about coal again, um, so what do you actually put in place? I mean, my answer would be to say look at nuclear power, you mm. know, as an example, as an alternative, because at the end of the day, we all consume energy and we all require energy. Uh, yes, we can look at uh, solar panels. Yes, we can look at the alternatives we can look at. Um, well, yeah. Francois, Peter, we have to stop okay. now, I'm afraid. No good okay. place to end a discussion like this, but I think the fact that we've aired the issues yeah. is great. I've learned a lot this morning, and I think the language we use, perhaps the point made right at the beginning, mm -hmm. the language we use is crucial in getting the attention so that it becomes embedded in uh, management practices. Mm -hmm. Thanks to my guests, Peter Lukey, he's from South Africa's Department of Environmental Affairs, Francois Bailefeld from SAP Africa, and joining us from Lagos was uh, Kega Ariz Nkwai, who is from Shell Nigeria Gas. Until next time, it's goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.